Good morning, it's really great uh, to be here on a rainy, I, I, I've got to say, uh, quite familiar uh, Liverpool. But that, that's over my lifetime, that's what I've come to know. Liverpool is a rainy city, and, and you, do get, you do get used to it. And now you can understand why people within the UK have to drill in the summertime, or as many times as they can do, it's flights to destinations that, that, that are slightly warmer. Uh, I'm just going to start off by firstly thanking Shelby for inviting me here today. And, and I really do feel truly honoured because where you're sat now, I, I was sat 30 odd years ago. I, I was a mature student by then because, as Shelby just explained to you, up to the age of 25, I was involved very much in professional sports. And then after, 20, after the age of 25, I ended up going back to college into university. And I, I, I often look at my time at the University of Westminster very fondly. And that's, that's because I was in the business school. And those of you who've been to business school will know that uh, as you get off of Baker Street, as soon as you get off, you have all these Sherlock Holmes that are down the front here. And uh, I used to really enjoy how I got off to the, the, the train there. Is looking at all these Sherlock Holmes and trying to picture the one I felt best resembled the Sherlock Holmes I knew as a child. And for me, that would be Basil Rathbone. Now, I appreciate that would mean nothing to you, but I'm talking about, about the old sort of 1940s, 1950s. Not that I'm that old. Uh, but uh, in the 1970s and the 1980s, they're, they're the ones that we would have shown on TV. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it was great getting on, and you're in that environment, and I, I'm absolutely convinced that you too, and, as you get off there, and you're going over to the business school, you must get captured within it. Because there's, there's, there's so much history there, and you're looking at that, and you think of you, you know, and it lifts your spirit. And something I'm going to be talking about a great deal. But uh, going back to what I was saying, I would say I met some really good friends during that time. Friends that I still have today because we share that common experience, not just the course, but dealing with the rituals of life, finding ways of coping with things as, as we move forward. And, and you're going to have to find your way too because it's not just academia on which you will have to deliver. You're going to have to have the ability to be able to cope with the stresses that you're going to have in your life. And that's a big, big deal. I remember one young lady who used to really, I, I, I couldn't help but admire her, because every time one of the lecturers said something, she really began to question it. And she had this marvelous phrase. She'd say, say, can you unpack that? I'd like you to unpack it. And I carry that with me for over 30 years with me now. Because what she was really saying is, explain it to me in such a way that I can consciously understand what it is that you're saying. And you know, you're going to look at people within your class. And some people may not resonate with you straight away. I go down, can't even remember that lady's name. But ironically, what I do remember is, is the thing that she taught me. That if I didn't know something, being brave enough to be able to ask. And that's the one thing that lady gave me all through my life. And I'm sure for some of you people are not a bit of pain in the foot. But if they don't understand it, I, I, I want to understand it. I, I want to also say congratulate you for being here. This is a really important point. You are not part of the 95% Say that again, you are not part of the 95%. And this is very, very important. 95% of people at university will graduate, graduate with good honours. They'll do really well. They'll become really efficient at what they do. They'll become so practiced in what they do that people will part with hard earned cash because they'll require their experience. But what they don't do is this they're unable to leave what they have in the workplace and they take it home with them. And they carry those stresses with them. They're unable to put the wave down. And 
over a period of a lifetime, those stresses begin to erode your dynamism. They begin to erode your energy. And it begins to tell. And if you don't look after your energy, then you're going to grow older faster than what you truly appreciate. You are part of the 5% because what you're willing to do, you're willing to take your time out and not just listen to um, the academic syllabus, but you're willing to look at your life and turn around and say, from a holistic perspective, how can I, how can I lay tools around me that I can reach down, pick these tools up and use in such a way that they'll help me cope with what I have before me. And that puts you in the 5% because you're taking your time out to do that. And I think because of that, you deserve to give yourself a round of applause. Let's have that round of applause now. Come on, give yourself a round of applause. Now, I, I need to warn you now. You can tell by that because I realise it's an early start. But most of, most of my talks really do involve participation. And sooner or later, during this, there's going to be an amount of participation. Okay, and I want to be looking for that for you. And there's a real strong reason as to why I do that, and I will explain it to you later. But when Shelby is brave enough to email, these are the first thing, which is the first time I've only just met now, she's brave enough uh, to email me, John, uh, how would you feel about this? I was, I was delighted with it, to be perfectly honest with you. Anyway, um, when she said that to me, I began writing and taking notes. I got all these notes, and I wrote them down, and it was incoherent. It was the biggest load of mumbo jumbo you've ever read in your life. And had I come here this morning and I started to speak that to you, I guarantee you, you would have looked at Shelby quizzing them and said, Who was that guy you brought to, to talk to us? I want to tell you about something that happened in the night. Something that you need to connect with. That night, I went to bed, marinating away in my subconscious mind with ideas, thoughts. And when I woke up that next morning, that incoherent scribble that was on my pad, I was able to make sense of it. I started writing down all these ideas, and it started to make a lot of sense to me. And I realised as I followed this rabbit hole down that I was then able to follow new ideas. And here I am able to talk to you this morning to have connected with me. Now you may have experienced something very similar yourself. For example, Alexa may have said to you, I want you to write a two and a half thousand word essay. You know the subject content, and it has to be in at such and such a time. And you've made a note of that. And when they said, then when the lecturer said to you, what this essay that needs to come in, you had all these ideas in your mind. You didn't write everything down, but you had lots and lots and lots of ideas. Because I can write about this, I can write about that. I must, I really must say this, because this is a real important point that I need to feature within my essay. And then you forget about it. And then one week before your essay is due in, you say, man, I best crack on with this, I best get on with it, I need to do something now. And you sit down, you engage your brain, and what happens? Nothing. Absolutely nothing happens. And it's a funny instrument, your brain, isn't it? In your mind. It's funny from the perspective that you think it's there to look after you. But the mind plays terrible tricks to us. It, it has the ability to underwhelm you, to tell you that what you're doing is too much, to tell you what you're doing you're not good enough to do. And we think that it's our friend, and sometimes it's not always that friendly to us. All the time. So what do you do? You can't think of nothing. So you then decide, you know what, I'm going to write a line. I'm going to write a line. You write a line, you put it down, and as you write it, you look at it and you say, God, 
not great, but it's something. So what you do then is you write a few more words that and you look at it and say, well, I've started. And you write a little bit more, something came across and oh I remember this thing. And then you start to write this thing down. And then all of a sudden as you follow this rabbit hole through, you follow this rabbit hole through, lots of ideas begin to move. And you're just back in that zone. You're back in that place that when you try to connect with the mind, you try to get it to do it, look and do it. But all of a sudden you've got this flow going on, you've got the action. And the question I'm putting to you now, what are you connecting with? Who are you connecting with? How are you connecting with it? That's the question I'm putting with to you today. So I want you to do, well, that's the question, I want to leave there hanging, we will come back to it. What I want you to all to do now is metaphorically, I want you to pluck from thin air a seed, a plant seed. Can you all do that for me now with your right hand? Pluck a right a seed. Come on, don't be shy. Pluck a seed, that's it, take it there. And what I want you to do is I want you to place it firmly in your left hand. Place it firmly in your left hand and place it tight. So what I've just done is planted the seed. Okay? Left hand. I planted plant the seed, it's in there. Okay. So what I'm saying to you, if you ever want to remember anything I'm saying to you, you just got to take that metaphoric seed, put it in your hand, clench it tight, and you will recall word for word, in a few reasons, what I'm saying to you here. Now, now, if what I say, you like what I'm saying, I want you to shake your left fist at me like this. That's it. Left fist, shake it at me, that's it. And just incidentally, if you don't like what I'm saying, tell me over there, can you shake your fist at him? <laughs> only joke, only joke, only joke. Right, um, so if I do say anything today that resonates with you, don't be shy. I want you to shake your fist. I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine for some strange reason, before I came in here, you said, John, I want to weigh you. So I get on these scales, I jump on these scales, and you weigh me. And you suddenly discover that that guy who was a, who was a lightweight, my boss back in the 1980s, was no longer a lightweight. And you, you lay in that, approximately probably around 13 stone. And then you ask me to talk, and I stand up here, and I begin to talk to you all. And then right in front of you, I have this massive heart attack. And I die. I'm done. And some strange reason, I don't know why, but some strange reason, you decide to weigh me again. The question is, how heavy I am? 13 stone before, two minutes later, you weigh me again. How heavy am, am I? And the answer is, I want to weigh the same. I want to weigh the same, because my body hasn't begun to, de to de uh, degrade or deteriorate. I want to weigh the same. Here's the important point, John, for a moment, isn't it? That all my organs are still there, my limbs are still there, my brain's still in there, but guess what? John is no longer in there anymore. There's something missing. There's something that's gone. And the question is, I'm to put to you again, what is it we connect with? What has it gone, and how do we connect with it? Okay, I just want that to resonate a little bit with you. Excuse me, I'll drink this water. I recall 18 years ago, I was in a lawyer's office when I was running my property business. I was in there waiting to uh, sign a contract. And right in front of me was a book really captured my imagination, this book. I read the blur. And often we do that. We read the front cover or the back cover and we put it back down. And no, this really can help me. I had to open this book and I started reading. The book was called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Has anybody ever read that book? The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. So you know exactly what I'm, what I'm going on. It, it's an absolutely fantastic book. And it appeared to me that Eckhart Tolle was talking to me. 
So here I was at the, the next sports person. That was used to feeling the stress. But all of a sudden now, I've got two officers, 15 staff, uh, lots of contracts, things, things going on. And I used to come home and I'd feel stressed. And yet I'd been taught tools to not put myself in that position. And Eckhart Tolle appeared to be talking to me. He was talking to me about the way I, I, I'm feeling my stresses. Interestingly, he was having this dialogue with himself. He kept saying, I cannot live with myself. I cannot live with me. I said to him, two of us. I give that to God, thank you very much. Don't forget, that's quite right. If I say anything that resonates, speak a bit of him. So, um, he felt, I felt as if he was talking to me, and he was saying, I cannot live with myself. And he, he, he's got to think about it, this duplicitous arrangement, this duplicity. Am I two people within the one body? Um, if we use the example of what I just gave you there, when John died, he's no longer there, but everything's still intact. We'd have to come to the, to, to the understanding that there's more to life than what resonates within my body. That has to be. That has to be because it's gone. But everything's still in there. And there's more to you than just the body itself. So we'd have to say that missing thing, if we call that I, and this is my interpretation of it, and myself was the brain. Okay, now. I want to leave those questions hanging and I want to bring it all back together. Okay, but I do want it to resonate with you a little bit. So I'm going to quickly go on to how, how I came here and a little bit of pain point coach and tell you a little bit about myself. Up to the age of 25, I was a professional tight kick boss. My last fight being in Miami in 1988. Long time ago now. And, uh, you know, you know, I've got to say, I, I mean, it, it's worth saying this now. Most people, when you talk to a, a, a boxer or a Thai boxer, they think it's dealing with a really aggressive person, the this, the that, and the other. You know, all that's very much show. Because the reality of it, when, when people finish, men or women finish, they'll often throw their arms around one another. There's a great, there's a great deal of, of respect within that area. But I knew. After that fight, March 1988, that I had enough, I, I needed a change. I had a great fight that, that particular night. Never once did I ever really want to hurt, hurt anybody. But I tell you what I did want to do. I wanted to be good at what I did. I wanted to be good. That meant a lot to me. And I didn't just want to win, but the way, the manner in which I won was important to me as well. Should I win? So I was 34, 27 wins. And uh, seven losses. Perhaps it's not the best record, but it's my record, and I, I, I've got to live with it because it's too late for me to change. I'll do anything about that now. Anyway, um, after I sold my business, I just felt, because I'm, I'm, I'm very much an active person, and I felt to myself that I'm not willing, and I don't want to, and I never see myself this way. What I'm saying to you here is very, very important. It's the way you see yourself. Because if you see yourself as defeated, you're right, you're defeated. If you see yourself as someone that has the ability to overcome, then you're equally right. And because of that, I created Pain Points Coach. What does Pain Points do? People respond to pain in two different ways. We either want to move away from pain and closer to something that we find pleasurable. And what I want to do is use my experience of business and my experience of, of sports, combine them both, and help people become more confident in what they do. And that's because, that's because we follow patterns, routines, and habits. And you'll have them forming now. You will have them forming since the age of seven. And they're nearly always form. <coughs> and you will fall into a pattern immediately. And that pattern may not save you. What my work does is try and 
trying to change those cognitive behaviors. I look at your behaviors and your beliefs, and I help you make small but impactful changes. I'll explain that a little bit later, how I do that. So I find myself coaching. I, I, I uh, life coach, uh, coaching individuals. I do workshops. I've got quite a few workshops on, on different things that may be on focus, team building, stress, obviously, and finding flow. Finding flow for me was something that really is important. And I want to tell you about that. I am also an author of a book, and this is my book, Find Your Flow, Take the Path of Mastery. Find Your Flow, Take the Path of Mastery. That you please know it's on, it's on Amazon now. You can get that book. And what that book, what that book is about is about finding your flow in life. So things sort of work out for you without having to put too much energy in it, in, into it. Because you become so practiced at what you do, so good at what you do, you can take something from the practice arena to the performance arena so easily because you are effective and good at what you do. So let me explain to you what flow looks like and when you see it, how you can recognize it. I want to talk about extrinsically first of all. You're looking at somebody that's in flow. Somebody that's in flow. Now, is there any psychologists in here at all? Any, any psychologists here? You're a young master, do you know me, hi, tits and me, hi. No, the Hungarian psychologist who's the, the, the flow. Uh, uh, me, hi, tits and me, hi. He's a Hungarian psychologist. Definitely have a look for him. Fantastic book to read. And of course, it's got my book as well over there. <laughs> it's all on the flow state. And what, what me, hi, tits and me, hi talks about is your experiences of flow. What I've done is tell you in my book how to get there how to arrive there and what the journey is about. That's what I've done with in my book. So extrinsically, if you're looking at somebody in flow, let me explain to you how that works. Do you recognize the energy of that person immediately? And you realize by through observation that what they're performing in front of you is really very, very complex. It's so complex what they're doing, but it's not the complexity that draws you draws your eye like a magnet into their orbit. It's not that that draws you. It's the simplistic way of how they perform. And it's the simplicity of the performance that they do for you that draws you in to their energy. And that's observing somebody in flow. You may have seen it in a sports person, you may have seen a theatre, a poet, a musician, a dancer. But you can't help but be drawn to it. You realise what they're doing is perfection. Now, to experience flow yourself, how do you get into a state of flow? Is through the state of joy. And how the joy comes about is this. Thank you. How, how, how the joy comes about goes like this. You become, you become so good at what you do that you don't have to need someone to tell you externally how good you've done. Feel it on the inside. You have a capability about you that says to you within this capability that although I'm stretching where I was before, I have the ability to become more because I'm so practiced in what I do. I think I can overcome this challenge in what I have at this moment in time. And you feel that way. And you're so focused in what you're doing, you'll likely forget about thirst, hunger, because you're so in that zone at this moment in time. Some of you may have experienced that. Some people experience it when they're writing an essay. You know, you just say, God, is that the time I didn't realize you become so involved in what you were doing? So raptured in the essence of what you are that you forget everything about you and in that zone. And it doesn't matter what comes at you, you have the ability to overcome it. And while you're in that state, you are in the state of flow. Judge Grenzo, sorry about this, I'm talking about 1950, these actresses again, so um, I apologize, apologize about that, but you can look these people up. Judge Grenzo used to appear in the black and white 1950s movies, the St. Trinian movie, so you can look that up on YouTube, Judge Grenzo. But she had a marvelous saying, I think, captures flow. 
she would say there is no such thing as the pursuit of happiness, but there is the discovery of joy. And that is to find flow in your life. So that tells you a little bit about what I do uh, and, and why I do it and why flow is so important to me. Now I did warn you earlier that what I do is that I like to get people involved and if you think you're just sitting there and listening to me, it's not going to happen. Okay, so lecturers as well, everyone. Can we all stand up, please? I want everyone to stand up. Everyone to stand up. The only true place you learn, the only true place you learn is when you're in the now. Something that really focuses your attention. Because if you're not fully committed to it, you're not really going to learn, you've got the energy to learn. But I want to know now how you feel today. Now I want to ask you, you've got to show your hands, don't look to the person next to you. It doesn't matter today how you feel. You tell me how you feel. If you feel really good, you might give me a 7 or a 10, you'll do this with all your students. If you're okay, you might give me a 4 to a 6 and it may look something like this. If you're feeling particularly well, you might give me a one, two, or three. So without looking next to the person next to you, give me your hands up. Show me how you feel. Paul, hands up, hands up, let me see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fantastic. Put your hands down now. Now remember, it's not, it's, it's so, so important that you do not look at the person next to you. That it's you. It's you. It's you I'm talking to, not the person next to you. Just you. If you want to do an exercise, you, you know, everyone must have heard of Tony Robbins, the American guru, the American life coach that helps people change beliefs and behaviors. Okay. And he says, and I think it's a marvelous saying, if you want to change your emotion, you have to change your emotion. If you want to change an emotion, you have to change your emotion. And I, and I, I agree with that completely. Because as soon as you start to move your body, you need you 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 absolutely focus. And I'll give you tell you exactly what I mean. How many of you somebody said to you, what's Dave's mobile number? And you go, Dave's number, what is it? What is it? And then your hands it goes with your thumb or your fingers, ding 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 ding. That's it. That's it. It was there, but your brain couldn't think about it, but the body remembered. It remembered or something within you that's connected to remembered and recalled it. Okay, so that's about changing your emotion and being in motion to do it. And that's exactly what we're going to do now. So I want to explain what you're going to do now. And you are going to step out a little bit of your comfort zone. Just remember these wise words now, because it's very important. If today you dim your light, if today you dim your light for the sake of somebody else in this room, then what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life it becomes a pattern and a habit and a routine that will serve you, but not particularly very well. Because what you're saying is this, I'm not prepared to stand out. And I'm suggesting to you that you need to, in this life, you need to be recognised for what you can do by committing to something. And we're going to look at first step today. So this is what we're going to do. Your hands are going to be out here, okay? And what you're going to do, you're going to suddenly thrust them back this way. You're going to go, like this, and I want to hear boom like this, boom like this, and then as you do it, your your butt is going to hit the back of the seat and back, and you're going to come out to go boom, and then you're going to do this. Now, if you've got a bad knee, a bad back, that's fine. You don't, you don't have to go right down, but I do want to hear boom. Now, if you gave me a seven or a ten, that's what you want to do. If you gave me a four to a six, that's what you're going to do. Now, if you're looking at the person next to you. I'm observing now, and I want to go through. You've got to ask yourself the question, do you want to dim your light forever in your life? That's what we're really talking about now. 